Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to our latest talk on CTA data processing uh, and acquisition. And I gave this talk in part at the University of British Columbia, so I thought I would share it with you. And I started off by mentioning that when you look at the evolution of CT, we continue to evolve, and I'm giving this lecture right now in September 2015, and in two months, RSNA is coming. That'll be November, December 2015, and you're going to see new scanners or some potential updates. So things are typically changing. But the big transition point, the real inflection point, was 2004, more than a decade ago, when 64 slice CT came along, because what that did is it gave us the ability to get thin slices on all patients, do it with a very rapid acquisition, and it changed the number of slices from the hundreds to the thousands. It also gave us isotropic resolution, which meant that no matter how we acquire the data, whatever plane we started, which was of course is axial, we can show it in any plane with the same resolution. And that really was a boon for 3D imaging and multi-plane on reconstructions. So I will say that 64 slides, when I go around and speak, is the state of the art in most practices. We have dual source at Hopkins. Other people have Toshiba and new GEs. But if you're 64 or better, everything I'm speaking about you can do, essentially. Maybe not do as well, but you can do. So we'll think about it that way. Now, the first thing with the CTA is the protocol. And again, one of the things we always focus on is protocols. The successful CT departments and CT examinations and good studies need good protocols. So things you need to decide. What phases do you need? We typically do not need non-contrast, but occasionally you do, which is in kidney CTA. What phases do you need? I need all the phases I need for the answer, but no more. And if I don't need three phases, two might be great, and sometimes one will be even better. The goal to me is doing the study right the first time and getting the answer right the first time. Doing it right the first time will decrease cost and will decrease radiation dose because you will not be repeating the study. You also need to know when you're making protocols what kind of contrast you're going to give, the volume, the timing, and delivery. You also need to know the parameters of your scanners. You have to make a protocol that's specific for each machine. If you have three different scanners, you need three different protocols. They will vary in KVP and MAS, slice collimation, slice thickness reconstructed, and into scan spacing. Maybe the things that kind of are the same from scanner to scanner. I've mentioned we like 0.75 by 0.5, but everything else from reconstruction algorithms will all be variable depending on the scanner. Now, CT is us. Many of you have been there. The reason we started CT is us was protocols. People wanted our protocols, and I got tired of Xeroxium, so we put things on the web. And the website has protocols. We've just updated the Siemens uh, Flash protocols. We're trying to update all of the protocols, and the protocols are pretty simple. If you look at them, we tell you everything. This is for pancreas, what phases we need. So we don't need non-contrast or delayed, okay? What's our respiratory effort? What's the KVP, the effective MAS? What's the time, the reconstructions, the collimation? We also speak about the contrast. How much, what type, what's the injection rate? Now, JCO is going to require this from all of you. You need to have it available. So you might as well get started now. And then things like slice thickness, reconstruction spacing, everything is there. So it needs to be built in. You don't want to be changing things from physician to physician, from radiologist to radiologist. You want to make certain you do the same protocol 24-7, 365. Now, I'm not saying never change your protocol, and I'm saying you should look at your protocols every few months or at least every six months. Make sure everything is up to date based on the new literature and modify things as necessary. We talk about what contrast to give. We talk about oral and intravenous. So with oral, we talk about for CTA, we're typically giving water, not volumen. And you can get very nice detail, as you can see here, of the vasorecta in a patient with Crohn's disease. Here it is with the MIP imaging. You can see both the volume rendering and the MIP. Or in this example, where there's a root of mesentery mass, calcified, subtle desmoplastic reaction, classic for carcinoid, there's the beating of the vessels. 
or this example, when you look quickly, the cecum doesn't look that impressive to you in this patient with GI bleeding, even if I circled it. But if I go from circling it to 3D reconstructions, now look at the vascularity. Look at that cluster of vessels for about 15 centimeters and the prominence of the patient's ileal SMA branches. You can see it very nicely here as well. Very, very impressive abnormal vascularity. Again, targeting it. Look at how abnormal the vessels are in the right colon. That's a very good example of angiodysplasia, a common cause of GI bleeding. Very nicely seen on the 3D imaging. Very easy to walk by on the axial imaging. We talk about multiple phases and things like GI bleeding in general. History of diverticulitis, looking for a source of GI bleed. If you can, if you did and it wasn't a radiation issue, you would do non-contrast. But my feeling is the best thing to do is don't worry about the non-contrast. Do two contrast studies, arterial and venous, same radiation dose as non-contrast contrast. But the advantage then is I could see bleeds that may only occur on venous phase imaging. When I look at both studies together, I'll be more accurate. So in this case, yes, it's very subtle. It's high density in the left colon. Maybe we thought it was, or the person reading potentially thought perhaps it was nothing significant. But then when you look at that area a few seconds later, you realize that the patient is actively bleeding from the descending colon. Classic for diverticulitis. Very nice example there. And here it is again looking at the volume rendering and MIP imaging. It's very easy to see here the presence of active bleeding into the patient's left colon. Now, what makes it easy, and you ask, why don't I worry about non-contrast? People speak of a non-contrast and they say, well, there's high density in bowel, you'll be fooled. But my rule is from arterial to venous, the lesions will appear different. So you'll see a different amount of blood present. If something would stay identical between arterial and venous, then I would worry perhaps I'm not dealing with a active bleed, maybe it's something high density, uh, but once things change, here's a good example, arterial to venous, easy to make the diagnosis. Also, it was always said that um, the uh, vascular imaging for bleed would be best detected arterially. I don't find that to be the case. Often, it's the venous phase that makes things very well. Now, the idea about protocols, let me go back a bit to protocols. Article uh, group of people wrote this article, including myself, talking about pancreatic adenocarcinoma, how we should look at things so that there's consistency across the board. And perhaps a template would be good. So I just wanted to make the point, I'm not a big template person to say the least, but many people are looking at templates. I like this article because it did more than tell you to use a template. This article maybe will be a model for other articles where it says, here's how you do the study. Here's how you interpret the study, and here's how you report the study. So for example, in this case, we talk about the scanner and slice thickness, the contrast material, image reconstruction. We talk about the various parameters for measuring the SMA or a common hepatic or celiac, and venous phase imaging from the SMV to the portal vein. We look very carefully at how we measure the things. And then we look at extra pancreatic disease. And we talk about different factors. This is all in the article. So what we're showing you here is not only talking about disease, but describing how you should describe disease. And so the goal is to have everyone reporting things the same way. That will go a long way if you're trying to have multi-centered trials. Um, another fact, this article by Brooke, that with structured reporting, which I was just speaking about, uh, surgeons were very happy. They were more confident regarding decisions about tumor resectability and when they reviewed structured reports before review of multiphasic CT images, that surgeons had sufficient information for surgical planning in 96, 69, and 98% of structured reports and 31, 43, and 25% of non-structured reports. So it's a very important thing because if it becomes important to the surgeon how they manage the patient, then it behooves us to do that. Now, when I speak about axial and I speak about multiplanar and 3D, 
And I ask the question, what do you need to do? I always say all of them, though it will depend on the specific case. Conceptually, even the easiest normal should be looked at in 3D or multiplanar because it's very easy to miss things on axial only. When you do the other planes, things become more obvious. And this is nothing new. Information available from a CT is far more uh, contains far more information than just the axial imaging. We always spoke about volume imaging required volume visualization. Same thing in other disciplines of science. Visualization is concerned with exploring data and information in such a way as to gain understanding and insight into the data. And then visualization is a process of transforming information into a visual form, enabling users to observe the information. So again, a very, very important concept that we collect information, then the whole thing is how we look at it. And the ability to see things in a volume is so much easier. So I like to show this case with an arrow showing you a dot and asking you what that dot is. Well, when you reconstruct that dot, is the left gonadal vein, which is a great landmark for laparoscopic nephrectomy. Okay, very easy to see there. Impossible to uh, see that only on the axial imaging. So very, very important. And here's the 3D imaging again. Just a very nice way, but also this concept of you need to be in the volumes. People often will say, well, if I look at a difficult case, then I'll look at the 3D. But you know, you're still going to miss a ton of stuff. The difficult cases, those are the easy ones. What about the ones you called normal or probably normal? What was present there? We speak about the information gained by looking beyond the axials. And so in this case with thickened bowel and Crohn's, you can see that as you go from the axial to the coronal, the coronal gives you lots more information, particularly about the vasa recta. But it is still limited as a 2D map. 3D MIP imaging, very nice view of the vasa recta up to the level of the patient's bowel. You can see the bowel enhancement. Uh, you can see those changes with strictures present. And then you go to the volume rendering, and now you see both the vessels and the bowel, the strictures, the soft tissue. Again, volume rendering is ideal and does supplement the MIP imaging. But you can see that it's a process of you need to involve everything if you want to get the best answer for your patient. And then, of course, there's description. Here's a patient with a pseudoaneurysm off the ascending aorta. You can see blood in the pericardium. And I can describe that for you. But boy, when you show these two images and show it adjacent to the suture line, so there was a, there was a pseudoaneurysm there. And you can show the patient's left coronary and right coronary. Again, visualization makes everything much easier, particularly in complicated cases. Um, the introduction of spiral CT, this is an article we wrote, um, is critical for driving this new technology. The key to CT imaging in the big picture is not the acquisition of data alone, but the use of the data acquired. And that requires 3D imaging and post-processing. Pam Johnson wrote that note, post-processing is no longer an option, but a true requirement in this era of 64 slice or better. A very important quote, an important quote to remember. Now, let me just end with one thing, and that's sort of a transition into a bit of 3D imaging. Hopkins, we've had a lot of experience over the past 35 years or so. A lot of it was not good. We had old Siemens hardware, which made terrible images. Then we went to the Pixar machines, which were great. Then we went to Sun and Silicon Graphics. And now we can do things with special purpose boards on Macs and PCs, and you can look at your iPad and your iPhone. So things are really evolving. Things are changing rapidly for the better. And just some examples. If you're really good, you can tell this is the pelvis. That's, that's not volume rendering or MIP. That's just simply shaded surface with this plastic hips. Or this case, this was the first images generated at Lucas Films for 3D, 1985 or 84, I think is probably more accurate. But within a few short years, we're able to really pick up the pace in volume rendering and then pick up the quality. So it looks something like this. These days, we can easily scan head to toe. 15 years ago, it was hard to do that. This patient had just expired. We scanned the patient. And then we created using five Pixar's for five days, 
couple of million dollars worth of computing, we created these images. So again, you could see that we could do things before, but we were pushing the envelope. And so you begin to see muscle, you begin to see color, you begin to see transparency. And just one more example here, and just to show you, I mentioned how we've gone from workstations that cost three, four hundred thousand dollars to iPads. And here's what you can see. Look at that focal nodule hyperplasia in the liver or this patient's runoff. So it becomes very important to realize that costs are in fact dropping, making these products potentially more available to us. One of the other questions with um, rendering is color. And we've always been big fans about color. I think grayscale is very good, but color seems to give you more display. This is a patient who's a potential renal donor, and you can see the patient's left uh, gonadal vein, left renal vein. It's much easier to appreciate in detail when you have the color. These are both volume rendered images, but you see the color, you see the detail. I think in perspective, it makes things a whole lot better. So we've covered a number of things, and I want to cover a little bit more in 3D imaging. So why don't we just take a couple minute break, 